on the theme of exploring the way in which our food and farming economic systems are distorted, so distorted that if you try to do the right thing by the environment and public health, you probably make significantly less money than if you are farming in ways which is damaging to the environment and affecting public health negatively. And we heard yesterday many examples of how that is happening and started to explore what to do about it. Now, this morning, we're going to take that further. And we have with us uh, a, a very interesting panel, and I would say that this session is really breaking new ground. We've been discussing the, uh, the issue of so-called externalities, the positive and negative impacts of different food and farming systems which do not appear in the price of the food that we buy, and the global uh, the, um, Tea Bag Food, which is an, in, an, an initiative which is funded by the Global Alliance for the Future of Food, who are our main conference sponsors. Um, have been looking at commodity studies, looking at, for instance, we explored yesterday the impact of palm oil, and one statistic which really shocked me was that if you look at the world price of palm oil, it's X, and if you add in the negative externalities to that price, it doubles it. And that's just one example of how distorted the prices are. But to take this board, we need to get a much more accurate picture of how at an individual farm, but also farming systems level, we understand the nature of the externalities, both positive and negative, both environmental and social, which are related to that particular farm. And to explore this uh, is a man called Dr. Harpender Sandu, who I met in Brussels last year at a tea bag food conference the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity of agriculture and food, and we heard from Pavan Sukhdev and Alexander Muller about their project yesterday. And I suggested to him it might be a good idea if he came over to the US two or three times from Australia, visited some farms, and put together a report for this meeting. And he said, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> and he did. And here, here are the farmers, and here is Harpenter himself. So I think, uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Harpender. Harpender, I don't know if you want to stand up or sit down, and maybe you stand up and then, I don't know, whatever you want to do, it's your show. Your, it's your show. But uh, I cannot tell you how thrilled and delighted I am that this happened, and that the farmers were so willing and brave, actually, courageous even, to put themselves forward for the study. So uh, will you please uh, give a warm welcome to Harpender Sandu. Thank you, Patrick, for your kind words. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers, especially Sustainable Food Trust, Patrick Holden, Sustainable Food Alliance, for giving me this opportunity to come here and speak to this learned audience. And I also like to welcome uh, my colleagues and uh, friends, Jim Adol from Southern Minnesota, Albert Strauss from California, and Joel Salatan from Virginia. Um, and I would like to thank them for accepting our invitation to be part of this panel where we are going to talk about externalities. And what are these externalities? Since yesterday, we have been learning about uh, different impacts of our food production system on environmental health, public health, and how we are going to develop food production systems which can actually enhance social and environmental benefits and lower some of the negative or environmental impacts or the negative impacts on the public health. Okay, so everyone in this audience had breakfast this morning, I guess, and we had a loaf of, a piece of bread or eggs or juice. And if I talk to this audience, I think you will know, everybody will agree that there are some negative environmental costs associated with that food. But if I ask you how much did it cost to buy your breakfast? $5, $7, $10, wherever you have eaten it, whether it was organic food or whether it was conventionally produced food. But if I ask you a question, how much did it cost? How much greenhouse gas emissions were generated? What was the impact on biodiversity? What was the impact on air? What was the impact on water resources? We have lots of qualitative information. 
We have been listening this since yesterday from many speakers. We know some figures at a national level. We know those figures, like if there is an impact on a, uh, diabetes, there is like billion dollars cost that is involved in the health insurance sector. But if I ask you a question, your breakfast had some kind of environmental impacts, and can you give me a number? Can you give me a dollar figure? Whether your $5 worth of a breakfast had $1 worth of environmental cost or $10 worth of environmental cost. I think so far we were unable to do this. And that's exactly the excuse our policymakers have been trying to avoid our case to internalize those externalities. Because we, 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 are, we were unable to demonstrate that kind of uh, external cost associated with our food production system. And thanks to this support by various organizations, I would like to acknowledge... Can you go to next slide, please? Clicker. Clicker right here. I can use this, yeah, thank you. So, Sustainable Food Trust, Global Food Alliance, and all these lovely farmers who agreed to participate in the research, we have been able to nail this problem. So, so what we have done is, we have done three case studies of three different farming systems. One is conventional corn soy system in Minnesota. Second is organic dairy farm cluster, or it involves four dairy farms. And third is uh, Joel Salatin's diversified farm. So I would like to acknowledge contribution of these organizations and many other mem members of these organizations, friends, my research colleagues, with whom I have worked over last, uh, over a decade to develop this methodology. And what is this methodology? It is in my po pocket. <laughs> yeah. This is the sustainability lens. We have been talking about global issues, global level, national level, but we are going to narrow it down using this lens. What are these different components of externalities? You can see this <coughs> Lego here. We are going to solve this puzzle. So green is for environmental benefits. Blue is for social benefits. Red Lego blocks are for environmental costs. And these yellow ones are the, the market price that a farmer gets. So we are going to solve this puzzle during this session, but I would like to draw your attention towards, I would like to take a little bit back about this issue at a global level. This, this image was shared by Jonathan Foley yesterday. Thank you, Jonathan, for share, uh, highlighting this cause, that cropland currently covers about 30 to 40 percent uh, land area world over. And we need more food to feed 9 billion people by 2050. And how we are going to produce that food, that matters a lot. And if we look into some trends from 1900 to 2050, we will need another half a billion hectare area to produce that amount of food, which is required to feed 9 billion people. And if we use current agricultural practices, we'll have to use more fertilizers, more, more pesticides. And we all know that there are high environmental and social uh, costs associated with this kind of a system. So what do we do? I think we as a foot soldiers have has some <coughs> responsibilities to contribute. And I tell you what. Jim, I tell you what. <laughs> yeah, I, I spent a couple of days in Minnesota, so I tell you what. There is no cavalry waiting on the hilltop to rescue us. It's us, the foot soldiers, farmers, practitioners, researchers, NGOs, advocates. We have to take this cause further. We have to develop those systems which can lower environmental impacts and generate positive benefits. So in this session, we are going to cover what are those externalities associated with theory farming systems and how we are going to do it. So this is one aspect of capturing all externalities, all ecosystem services and ecosystem disservices associated with farming systems. That's exactly what we have done. We have analyzed, we have used this farm sustainability lens to analyze these different categories of externalities. 
And if you look into conventional agriculture output, input-output system, agricultural output depends on seed, fertilizer, pesticide, fuel, labor, etc. But there are some invisibles. There are positive and negative externalities. And these positive and negative externalities are pollinators on farmland, soil health, microbial activity, maintaining soil health, uh, parasitic wasps, predators, uh, biological control of insect pest, carbon sequestration, cultural services, amenities, and there are negatives attached, which we all know about greenhouse gas emissions, um, eutrophication, uh, pesticide, um, antibiotic resistance, etc., and etc. So we are trying to make these invisibles visible through our, our case studies. And the, the kind of a framework that we have, we have used is we have analyzed input and outputs of each of these farming systems that generate some environmental impacts and some social impacts. So we have captured all those impacts. And apart from impacts, which are like uh, normally we talk about agriculture as, uh, as a mostly negatively impacting, but there are several social and environmental benefits which are associated with different farming systems. And we have highlighted those as well in this research. So, and we have divided those into four different categories. Uh, production value, which is a farm gate value of a produce, and environmental benefits, environmental costs, and social benefits. And we are going to talk about these methods in detail in another parallel session, which is led by Alexander Mueller at 2 o'clock. But here we are just going to share the results of three farming case studies. So without taking more time, I would like to invites Jim Adal from southern Minnesota to describe his farm, and then I will present the summary of the results. Over to you, Jim. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning. I'm Jim Erdahl. I produce corn and soybeans in southern Minnesota with my wife, daughter, and son-in-law. The farm uh, was settled by my great-grandfather in 1878. He built uh, a house nine years later. My daughter and her husband currently live there. Just last month, the sixth generation arrived. Don't know if he wants to farm yet. He's still a little wet behind the ears. <laughs> but I want to give him that opportunity if he so chooses. In order to give him that opportunity, we need to take care of the land, be good stewards of the soil. My dad started uh, steps to protect, protect the soil in the mid-70s. In 2008, I started using a strip-till system to produce the corn and soybeans. Strip-till disturbs less than 30% of the soil surface leaves more than 70% of the previous crop's residue intact. In the fall, immobile nutrients are incorporated in the strips, GPS navigational tracking, as well as variable rate fertilizer is used to build the strips or zones. At planting, seed is placed in the strips along with liquid starter fertilizer injected with the seed. All functions of the strip till and planting operations are electronically monitored, such as tractor performance, field tracking, seeding rates, fertilizer applications. The data is logged for further or future reference. Sometimes it feels like I have more video screens in my tractor cab than a good sports bar. <laughs> the nitrogen or any other mobile nutrient applied to the corn is done at planting in three split applications. This meth method helps to prevent over-application, denitrification, and leaching of the nutrient. Soybeans are legumes and need no added 
nitrogen. To limit the possibility of pesticide and fertilizer runoff, we have restored wetlands for upland water retention and native vegetation buffers around rivers and streams. All this planning and work in hope of a bountiful harvest and um, to fill our grain bins, sell our commodity at a fair price, and prosper along with our community. Have I completed my goal of being a good steward to the land? No. But every day I try to get better so that my children and my grandchildren will have a farm that is both environmentally and financially sustainable. I thank Patrick for inviting me to this conference and Harpenter for his work and research in this case study. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for explaining this uh, farm. Um, like what kind of a major technologies that you've been doing. And uh, I would like to mention that this strip tillage system is something which is, which conserves lots of, uh, which has lots of multiple benefits, not just uh, uh, benefits in terms of saving of fuels and, uh, but also it, it, it improves the soil health, it improves uh, uh, water holding capacity, and also helps in capturing carbon, which is an additional benefit. So as, as, as we, we examined um, Jim's farm from his input and output data, and we categorized those into four categories. So production value of the corn and soy are the major commodities produced on Jim's farm. And the environmental benefits, which we could measure, was water regulation, how much water is used by the crops, and how much is surface runoff and how much of that water goes into the aquifers or groundwater recharge. So the value they are used is used to reflect that environmental benefit. Similarly, carbon sequestration by vegetation on this particular farm and nitrogen fixation by soybean. And what are the environmental costs? Environmental cost categories were greenhouse gas emissions and external costs associated with pesticide and fertilizers. And the farm also generates social benefits in terms of uh, providing uh, farm employment, so it was also classified as well as uh, it was monetized. So I would like to share some results. So if you look into production benefits, which is very straightforward, uh, 220 bushels per acre, it's, it's valued at uh, farm gate value of $4, so it gives you $884 worth of a production from corn. And similarly, soybean at 690 so this is the farm gate value of these two commodities. Very simple, very easy to um, get from the farm records data. But these environmental benefits like water regulation, how much is the water price currently? This morning I was speaking to a gentleman from Chicago who works in water services industry. They charge 0 0.004 per, for a gallon of water. I have used a figure 0 0.006 dollars for a gallon of water. So we currently are not valuing our natural resources that high. So that's why these, the figures reflected like $33 for corn per acre per year or $26 for soybean per acre per year are very conservative estimates, very minimal estimates. So if we start valuing our water as a $1 a gallon or a $3 a gallon, these figures will, will, will skyrocket, so they will jump through the roof. So similarly, uh, carbon capture, carbon value changes every year, every day. So I have used a value of $15 uh, for per metric ton of a carbon sequestered on this particular form. So that gives us a value of $18 per acre per year. Similarly, nitrogen fixation in soybean, which is free service provided by leguminous crops, and valued at a current nitrogen price uh, for $12 per acre per year. And social benefits which were captured in this farm 
are associated with the farm employment on this particular farm. So they, they were valued at about $134 per acre per year. If we combine all these values together, we get a nice picture of per acre per year. But there are environmental costs associated which are more interesting to see that this particular farm uses fertilizers and pesticides and these fertilizers, pesticides, diesel use, um, strip tillage, um, electricity use, all have greenhouse gas emissions associated with them as well as some other external costs associated with particularly with fertilizer and pesticides. So if, if, I'm not sure if you can read these figures, but I, I can just mention um, that per acre fertilizer use has a greenhouse gas emission in this case, in this particular case is about like $101 per acre per year. So that's a kind of a figure we, we have come, come to this point. And then strip tillage, how much is greenhouse gas emissions associated with strip tillage? and fuel use, electricity use, and we have worked those figures. And what are these external costs, which are the major costs involved in these systems? They involve all of these listed costs in a very minimal, very conservative estimates of all these categories. So what are these categories? Impacts of honeybee pollination, what is the budget of USDA, US EPA at a national level? So how much they are spending to fix pesticides, nitrates in water, food poisoning, food safety. So all these categories which will be available in a report, very difficult to read from, from, from this uh, PowerPoint. But all these flood damages, impacts on waterways, impacts on fisheries. So all these are worked out at a per acre, per year level for this particular uh, case farm study. So this. For just for fertilizer, it comes out to be more than $100 per acre per year. And then similarly for pesticides, it, it, its figure is about $56 per acre per year. So these are the kind of external costs which are generated, which are calculated in this case. So adding them up into four different categories of production values, Environmental benefits, so this, in this particular case, the environmental benefits generated comes out to be $89 per acre per year. Social benefits worth $134 per acre per year, and it generates uh, environmental cost, which is very conservative estimate. Um, it's a limitation of data, $219 per acre per year. So you can see the true cost of per acre per year of corn and soybean farm comes out to be roughly 1,578 as, as compared to what, what kind of its, uh, its farm gate value. So we went a little bit ahead of this and what it means actually per bushel. Can we do it for a per bushel of corn, per pound of milk or per pound of meat? So we went one step ahead. And if you look into corn, its farm gate value is $4 per bushel. It generates environmental benefit worth 60 cents per bushel, social benefit worth 40 cents per bushel, and environmental cost about $1 um, per bushel. So we classified that into not only per acre per year, but for, for consumers to understand, we, we went this far that let, let's do this calculation at the per bushel level so that everybody can understand. Similarly, for soybean, the farm gate value was $10 per bushel. It generates environmental benefits worth $1.29, social benefits worth $1.90, and has environmental cost about $3.17. And if you look into percentages, it's about like 25 to 35% of the current farm gate value is, um, is the environmental cost. But at the same time, we don't want to look, this, this lens is not looking into environmental cost or negatives. It is looking into this social and environmental benefits as well. So in, at this kind of a farm, because of its, it's already doing its sustainability practices, the ratio of environmental benefits and cost is about one is to one. So if, if I was explaining this to my kids when I was preparing this talk and they saw that, okay, this is a bar chart 
And, and my little daughter, she said that, okay, I can do it uh, using my Legos. So, so I brought them here, very easy to, for children to understand what are, what are we talking about. So these are the environmental benefits. These are the social benefits with blue, and this is the environmental cost of this particular farm. So you can clearly see environmental benefits and cost are one is to one ratio in this particular farm. And these results are very specific to this farming system, this particular farm, it cannot be generalized. We need more kind of a study, so I'll come back to that, but I will stop here and I will invite Jim to provide any comment on these results. Thank you. Well, I think um, um, the frustration that, that a Midwest corn and soybean farmer would have is some of the policies, the federal um, food policy and the farm program, um, all kind of, it's very difficult to, um, to balance the environmental and, and the financial on, on the farm. That's all I do. I don't have any other job but to produce for my family using selling corn and soybeans. Um, the way the farm programs are written, it's, it's, it's hard to change to add a rotation to my, to my crop. I, it's financially difficult to do that. And I think um, what we need to do is, is maybe change the, the, the policy. Um, and I think Harpenter's uh, research here gives us, as farmers, benchmarks that we can, we can try to attain. And if we could get, um, you know, more people or, or government programs more interested and more focused uh, on that, on these externalities and how we're going to pay for them, um, it would be helpful from a production agriculture standpoint to do that. Um, yeah. I think that's, this research is really important to me. Um, like I say, it gives me something to shoot for. So I thank Harpenter for his good work. Thank you, Jim, for your comments. And now we would like to move from Minnesota to right into California. And I would like to invite Albert Strauss, who needs no introduction, to talk about uh, four farms which were part of this study. And uh, uh, I would like to invite Albert to describe that uh, dairy farming operation in this, in, in, in this capacity. Yeah, welcome, Albert. Thank, thank you, Harpenter. Am I on? So, um, thank you for all the work. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Harpenter, for actually giving us tools to, that, we can, that we can look at how we can benchmark and make a difference. So, history of my farm and my creamery are that my father started the farm in 1941 in Marshall, which is just 60 miles from here up on the coast. It's one of the more beautiful areas that I know of in the world. And um, he, he operated as a conventional farm for many, many years. Uh, we have had challenges as a family farm. How do, you, how do you stay in business? How do you pay yourself? How, you, how do you um, succeed to the next generation? And I came back from college and tried to work on well, I should back up a little bit, but um, I, I try to work on feed costs, which is 40 to 6 percent of our income. I use all kinds of crazy materials, like I look through the yellow pages to look for tofu waste, sake waste, coca bean holes. Anyway, the, the, the summary is that there's no winning in, in that kind of uh, economics. So in Marin County, we had in 1960, 150 dairies. When I came back, there was probably 
uh, 40 of them left in, in the in late 70s. Um, my parents, I, I think farmers are environmentalists. We've, on our farm, we, we hadn't used any herbicides or synthetic fertilizers since the, since the 70s and early 80s. We had fenced off our streams and waterways from animals, contaminate them. I had used no-till planting for, for silage crops since the early 80s. And all these practices were great. My mother actually started the first agricultural land trust in the nation, Marin Agricultural Land Trust, and they preserved half the farmland in Marin County. Yet, how do you survive as a family farm and a community, a rural community? Um, and so I became certified organic in the beginning in 1994, as first certified organic dairy and creamery in the Western United States. The, the, now we have nine family farms that are supplying our creamery. They're all certified organic. They're all verified non-GMO, because I found GMOs in my certified organic corn. Um, and we're looking at how can we make a sustainable model to, to pass on to the next generation and also to revitalize our community. So I'm going to keep it to that, keep it short. And so Harpen has more to talk about. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Albert. Thank you, Albert. And I, I'll present results from these uh, four dairy farms which are producing organic milk and supplying to this uh, Strauss family creamery. Uh, so we again looked into all the input and output data provided by these four, four uh, different farms and classified them into uh, these four categories, environmental benefits, water regulation, carbon sequestration, nitro nutrient cycling, nitrogen fixation, and, and, and social benefits. Apart from farm employment, there are some tours that these farms, they organize, and people come for recreation, they get some education. So people like Albert, they travel um, um, to different parts of the country to provide that information. So we have captured all that information and try to populate these figures uh, and if we look into uh, production benefits, so per acre, per year, I, ha I have provided uh, these um, values at per acre per year, and, and then I have done some analysis to provide a value at a <coughs> gallon of milk. So environmental benefits like uh, carbon capture uh, by trees, by pastures, and apart from that, there is a methane capture. So one of the farms uh, has a methane digester. So what methane digester does is, I think Albert can explain it a little bit later, but it captures, it avoids methane um, going out in the atmosphere. So that's how it avoids that carbon dioxide equivalent uh, in, like, uh, in the capacity of about 1,200 tons, metric tons per year. So that's a huge benefit. So we have captured those kind of values, how much carbon is avoided, plus this methane digester helps to generate um, their own electricity. So again, if you borrow that, if you buy that electricity from the grid, you are avoiding, you are, you are having several greenhouse gas emissions, which you are again avoiding by having a methane digester. And what it means to a farmer, I, I think Albert is going to speak about that. But at a per acre value, we also looked into social benefits, uh, employment, like uh, how much is the uh, per acre, per year uh, kind of a value, <coughs> recreational benefits. So although these figures are very conservative, that's why you will see lots of figures in cents and, and very few in dollars. Because we don't have those figures. We, we still do not value our environment that high. We do not value our social benefits, which are provided by these farms, very high. And when we, as we go forward, when there is a, like a more realization that we put more <coughs> effort in realizing these benefits, I think these values will again improve. And obviously there are environmental costs associated with um, different operations at a dairy farm. Whether it is organic or conventional, still there are like greenhouse gas emissions associated with milk production, animal feed, manure, 
because manure is a like a major cause of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and how much of it is like uh, cycled in a way that it provides benefits and how much of it ends in our waterways or, or, or provides pollution to the atmosphere. And apart from that, um, electricity use, diesel use, all these um, inputs were uh, again looked into how much greenhouse gas emissions are produced and then they were valued accordingly. So if we come to this per acre kind of a value, so this farm produces environmental benefit worth $190 and uh, social benefits worth about $500. At the same time, there are high environmental costs associated with this kind of operation. Again, this is study of these four farms, so there is a range there. But we are providing like average results here of these four farms. But if you include other farms, I think, I think these values will differ. So then again, we went like what it means to a consumer like how we can explain it in, in, in a better way. So for a gallon of milk, if a farm gate value is $3.44, there is eight cents of environmental benefit, 20 cents of uh, social benefits, and about 25 cents of environmental cost associated with this uh, gallon of milk. So again, if we use this kind of a Lego, we can demonstrate what are the environmental benefits. Social benefits are high in this particular uh, uh, production system and the environmental cost is relatively high but it's again in the ratio of one is to one. So you can demonstrate we need to do more studies obviously of a different production system but I will stop here and I will invite Albert to, to comment on these results. Thank, thank you, Arvind. Um, our milk's not expensive enough. Um, obviously, um, so I want to um, kind of talk about environmental benefits. So on our farm, so there are four farms that, of, our, of our, the farms that supply our creamery that participated in this study. And um, on our farm, we do, we kind of try to make a model and a, and a, a, um, a model for other farms to to be able to replicate. So we do a lot of trials. So we're part of the Marine Carbon Project, which we're showing that by um, farming methods, um, uh, pasture, uh, pasture management, water development, fencing, rotational grazing, um, also uh, adding compost to the land to be able to build organic matter. Um, and, it all helps sequester carbon into the soil and into the plants, and planting hedgerows and windbreaks, and those are types of practices that we're doing on our farm. And if we were to do that on, excuse me, um, sorry, there was a statistic here. <laughs> um, it, it was, I don't have it in front of me, sorry. Um, oh yeah. This methane digester, sorry. Um, it was going to have a, quite a significant impact on if we did on all nine of our farms. I'll pull up the figure if I can find it. Um, the second part of it was that we have a methane digester on our farm that we, for the last 14 years, no, 12 years, we've been capturing all the methane from the manure and all the waste from the creamery and producing all our own energy and half our hot water that we need for washing our dairy, which has taken a greenhouse gas out of the atmosphere that's 23 times more detrimental than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas, as well as um, producing energy. Um, so if we were able to do that on all of our dairies, that, that would... Um, that would take 3,000 3, vehicles off the roads, equivalent to 3,000 vehicles. Um, and if we did it on two-thirds of the dairies in California, um, that would take a million vehicles off the road. So those are some significant figures. Uh, social benefits is something that um, I feel is very important, especially when we're looking at rural communities 
dying throughout this country and throughout the world. Um, farms are employing people. They're we're working. They're, they're employing themselves. I mean, farmers themselves have struggled. We we have so many less farmers in this world, and in this country, that. Um, it's always been a struggle to produce high quality food, take care of the environment, and also pay yourself, much less pay people that are working for you a decent wage. So I think that by recognizing this and benchmarking the social values, we can start building from that and help to revitalize our farms and our communities. Um, the costs. Um, yeah, I think you know, doing an organic farming system and doing a system that uh, doesn't have GMOs in it, doesn't have, um, uh, has a healthy product that's coming from it, we can benchmark what we're doing and try to really build from that. So those are the comments I have right now. Thank you. Thank you, Albert. Now, we would like to move to Virginia, and uh, I would like to invite Joel Salatin to talk about his farming operation. And I must say that I have worked around the world with farmers of very different types, but I've never come across this farming system. <laughs> <laughs> this is beyond my imagination. <laughs> I, I let Joel explain that. It's beyond organics, it's beyond biodynamic, beyond sustainability. It's very sustainable farm. Over to you, Joel. Thank you, Harper. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say uh, thank you for Patrick and for the Sustainable Food Trust and Alliance and Harpenter and the work here. Um, you know, those of us that are out in the trenches, uh, it's not a friendly world out there. You know, our neighbors think we're bioterrorists because we <laughs> don't vaccinate our cows. Um, and we're weird, you know, because we bring, we, we put people on these back dirt roads, you know. What do we want people around here for? <clears throat> and <clears throat> the environmentalists don't get us because, you know, we're actually, we call ourselves environmentalists, but we're actually farming. I thought farming destroyed the environment, you know. So, anyway, what I'm getting at is that I'm just blessed and grateful to be here for two days. I, I feel like... Um, I'm, I've been plunged into a cleansing bath of affirmation. <laughs> and and, and I'm, 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 I'm hooked up to a pure oxygen hose of <laughs> inspiration, encouragement, and our tribe. And I thank you for that. For that. All right. Um, let's run through this very quickly. Um, I just want to touch uh, very quickly some of the things that we do. Um, we have a lot of forest land on our farm, and, and Harpenter, of course, you know, put the carbon uh, of that uh, in. But we have a sawmill. We generate our own lumber. We mill lumber for the community, for neighbors and things. Let's see. Next. Okay. Um, and so we're, <clears throat> we're, uh, we're pretty self-sufficient on lumber. We can build houses. We can build, you know, sheds, buildings, uh, all sorts of things with our own lumber. When we feed hay in the wintertime, the cows come in on a carbonaceous diaper, so we chip, we chip the branches and, and, and the carbon generator from wood's work, and that becomes a carbonaceous diaper under the cows when we feed hay in the wintertime. We put uh, corn in that, the cows tromp out the oxygen, create a fermentation, we call it a carbonaceous diaper, and the corn ferments in there, so when the cows come out in the spring to go grazing, then we put pigs in there, we call them piggerators. They seek the corn, and in doing so, rotate, aerate, and turn that from anaerobic to aerobic compost. So we're using appreciating infrastructure, pigs, to do the, the compost work. And this is the heart and soul of the farm. It's a, it's a completely carbon-centric deal. Then the pigs go out into pig pastures. So these are the savanna silvo pastures of yesteryear. It's important to realize that that, that 5,000 years ago, the planet actually carried more pounds of animals 
than it does today, even with all the CAFOs and all the people on the planet. The megafauna that was here, that was in New Zealand and Australia and Europe, uh, the, the bison, the wolves, the beavers, 8% of North America was water from beaver ponds. The, 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 the sheer uh, vibrancy of choreographed migratory life and synergistic animal-plant, animal-animal relationships was hard to imagine. And so we're using the pigs in this history historic disturbance role to bring back these magnificent silvo pastures. <clears throat> this was not, this grass was not planted. The seeds were latent in the seed bank. Maybe they're a thousand years old, but in the short-term pig disturbance, then they spring forth and germinate, simply using the animals as a landscape masseuse <laughs> in the historical role of animals. And so this then creates it creates a, another whole tier of production under the forest. So instead of just being trees, now you have trees and you have all of this uh, prairie growing underneath it, which of course doubles up the biomass and all that. The, um, the cows are essentially, um, we don't have buffalo, we don't have wolves, but we do have electric fence and we have cows. So they are our herbivore pruners to take the senescent the senescent forage and prune it back to very rapid juvenile growth. We call the herbivores our biomass accumulation restart button. And so uh, we move them every day at four o'clock. Um, here you see them in February on the top slide. Uh, in February, 80 dry cows on half an acre a day. Bottom slide, 300 head on two acres for a day in August. All right, so they're clumped up. We call this mob stocking, herbivorous, solar conversion, lignified carbon, sequestration, fertilization. <laughs> and if every farm in North America would do this in in, in fewer than 10 years, we would sequester all the carbon that's been emitted since the beginning of the industrial age. That's how fast this can work. Well, the, when you're moving them around, they need shelter. So we have portable shade mobiles built on elongated wagon chassis. We can hook them together and we can, we can have 240 head under portable shade. So if we're going to duplicate the migratory choreography of animals, we have to have portable water, portable shade, and portable control mechanisms. So we've built permaculture fashion, some dozen or more ponds up in valleys and highlands, and then we let that flow down by gravity, so we have 80 pound pressure water, six miles of water line around the farm that's all piped with gravity, no electricity, no, no, uh, vat, no, no uh, um, relays, no electrical switches, no pumps. Uh, it's all gravity. And the day gravity quits, <laughs> I'm out of here. Um, <laughs> But then, we, so we, all, we use that water not only to water the stock, but also to irrigate. And then we've begun the last several years uh, duplicating what Colin Sice is doing in Australia. Uh, probably as big a breakthrough now uh, worldwide as Electric Fence was 50 years ago when Andre Voisin was doing his experimentation in, in uh, France on, on rational grazing, what he called it. Uh, this is where we use, we combine holistic management a la Alan Savory style with the no-till planting technology, and we combine the two so that instead of a fertilizer and an herbicide, we simply use the animal as a preparation tool to beat down the perennial long enough to give us a window of opportunity to plant an annual. Now in Australia, 2,000 farmers are using this for cereal grains. We're using it for summer grazing to, to grow cowpeas and sudex and things like that to fill the, the summer slump uh, grazing period. Here you see sudex. You can see here uh, where they've, they've just grazed on the left and, uh, or wherever it is, I, I don't know whether I'm turned, yeah, left, uh, where they've just grazed, and you can see it on the right, there's an electric fence going down to, uh, to uh, control the two. Then we follow the cows with the egg mobiles. Again, taking a pattern out of nature before Merck Pharmaceuticals. How did nature sanitize behind herbivores? With birds. You know, the egret on the rhinos knows the birds that follow the, the, the uh, Cape buffalo in Botswana. And so the egg mobiles, these are 800 layers, and they free range out, scratch through the cow patties, eat out the fly larvae, and basically turn the grasshoppers and crickets into eggs. You can actually raise more protein per acre in insects than you can with meat or milk. And so we simply layer permaculture 
agriculture fashion, stacking on that an additional enterprise and take what would normally be a liability of parasites, maggots, and, 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 and uh, you know, worms and grubs, and we turn those liabilities into an asset, so we collect $300,000 worth of eggs as a byproduct of the pasture sanitation program. And then... And then um, if we don't want to do the egg mobiles, then we do pastured eggs. This is called the Millennium Feather Net. It's an A-frame portable structure that we move around with electrified netting. And then we incubate the eggs. We're, we're hatching our own chicks uh, so that we're doing functional genetics. In the winter, these go into the house with stackable, uh, uh, you know, pigs underneath, chickens on top in hoop houses. Then they come out in the spring. We grow produce in these hoop houses because the animals have debugged them and put down the fertilizer. The rabbits go out on pasture. An acre of grass put through rabbits is worth $50,000. Uh, uh, broilers are on pasture with portable field shelters that are floorless. The gobbledygo is a portable turkey structure. The turkeys go around. See the cows in the background the chickens. Look at the stacking enterprises on this. And the favorite thing we're doing now is germinating young farmers. Here's one that we germinate. We do an intern apprenticeship program uh, to germinate young farmers to start their own enterprises, whether it's mushrooms, animals, whatever, uh, bees, uh, name it. These are our grandchildren. Uh, they're now in their enterprises with lambs, duck eggs, and uh, farm tours, making enterprises to meet people in the urban sector, but it all revolves around bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, self-starter young people who, at this stage in my life, to be surrounded by youthful enthusiasm and energy is just indescribable. And so ultimately, we believe the sustainable farm is one that the children want to inherit and stay, and that's our rainbow. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> and, and then when I visited Joel and his farm and I thought, why I took this job? How I can, how I can manage all these processes and all these lovely things into numbers? My limited questionnaire went all over. <laughs> so we ha I have to write on the sides, on the margins. There are a number of processes which I have never seen. So th this was very difficult. This was a big challenge for us to bring all this information into some numbers. And using this tiny sustainability tool. <laughs> wow. But, but I think we, we managed. We, we did something. Yeah. So I will jump into, uh, again, results straight away so that we can, we'll, we'll have some time for discussion. So we captured all these benefits, social benefits, environmental benefits, and cost associated with the uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, some related with the livestock production, uh, mostly with the diesel use, electricity use, and then social, uh, and, and we came up to, I will jump into these results here. The environmental benefits provided are, say, $170 per acre per year. Social benefits are, very high, six fifty dollars, as 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 you would hope from this kind of a farming system. And environmental cost is quite low, which is hundred fifty. So I translated this information into something a pound of meat, a dozen of egg. So if we examine, um, look into the pound of beef, dollar sixty is a farm gate price. It generates environmental benefit was seventy cents. Social benefits, $2.67, and $0.63 cents of uh, environmental cost. If we look into a pound of uh, uh, pork, $3.67, farm gate value, environmental value, $0.71, cents. social value, $2.70, $2 environmental cost, about $0.63. Cents. Then, similarly for poultry, $3.50 per pound. $1.91 for environmental benefit, $7.20 for social benefit, $1.70 for environmental cost. And for similarly for dozen of eggs, $3.40 for environmental benefit, $13 worth of a social benefit per dozen of egg, and $3 worth of a environmental cost. So if we add up all these together, I think the benefit to cost ratio is about one is to five. 
So you can imagine this kind of a farming system. So the, when, I, when I completed my study, I simply asked Joel a question, why can't we replicate these kind of systems? We have been talking about that we need this system, we need this system, but these systems exist here. They are working, they are functioning, they are making money, they are, they are working with community, why can't we replicate? So if we come back to our Lego, this green is environmental benefit, you can see this tower going high and high, and there is still, there is a little bit of environmental cost associated with it. So why can't we replicate this kind of a system? So I would like to invite Joel uh, to provide some comments on these results. Over to you, Joel. Be brief. <laughs> yeah, I, I, will, I will be very brief. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I don't normally compress the farm into 10 <laughs> minutes, but anyway. Uh, yeah, my response is, um, a, a, to just acknowledge, I, I can't imagine doing what Harpenter did or does, so I, I salute that effort. Um, I think that our challenge is to get consumers, individuals, to understand that when they participate with us, that, that they, they don't have to be um, um, non-participatory bystanders in this great choreography of land healing. Uh, in one of the sessions I was um, uh, attending yesterday, the question was asked, why do we produce food? And the answer was to feed people. I disagree. Why do we produce food? Fundamentally, it is to heal the planet. Monsanto says it's to feed people, okay? So un unless and until we're actually healing first, nothing else really matters. And I think that we offer, we, the message that we can give our customers and our society is you can get in this game of land healing and participate with your food dollar, healing the planet one bite at a time. And that's an excited, sacred thing to be a part of. Thank you, Joel. I'd like to conclude. Like to do some conclusion, conclusion, yes. and then Q and A. Yes, you can do conclusion. Yes, yes. So I would like to thank all my panel members, Jim, Albert, and Joel, for sharing this uh, information. And just few concluding remarks, like how we can use this information, what it means to us. So Joel has uh, rightly summarized that we want consumers to participate in this land healing program. But just, just a, like a quick summary of our results, like if we look into different products from three farming systems, corn, soy, uh, milk, eggs, poultry meat, beef and pork, so there is a benefit cost as a, associated with each commodity. So which in corn, soy and milk, it is one to one ratio of benefit cost, whereas in diversified production system, it's one is to five. So I will just summarize into these three uh, graphs here. So what it means, we are providing more environmental and social benefits by a particular type of farming system. So we need to learn from those kind of a systems which can generate more benefits and minimize environmental costs and how we can use this information. So obviously one is to improve farming practices. Second thing is to raise awareness among consumers that what, when we are supporting or when we are buying a particular product or a commodity, what are its impacts or what are the benefits? If it is a commodity which is produced in a way which is more, which is providing more social benefits, I might choose to buy that particular product. So this is the way we can utilize this information. And uh, above all, I think we want to influence policy. Because where are the incentives to generate these environmental benefits on a farm and to minimize environmental cost? So going back to the main aim of the conference, we want to, we want to reset that economic and policy environment so that we can produce food, more food, but in a way which is more sustainable, less detrimental to the environmental health and human health. 
So I think we need to examine these results in that particular context. And just few learnings that these farming systems are already generating lots of positive benefits. So we cannot generalize them that all farming systems are similar. So we need to do more studies, need to involve conventional systems, uh, conventional dairy, conventional corn, grain, or livestock systems, so that we can set a benchmark. So that benchmark is definitely required. So now we have this methodology, we have got these case studies, but we don't have that benchmark. We cannot say that we are doing well or not. We, have, we cannot compare with each other, or we cannot compare with the industry standards. Similarly, if we have more studies, we can set some kind of industry standards or some kind of a practices, so which can be utilized by consumers and policymakers alike. So I, I will stop here, and uh, I would like to thank you, participants, uh, my panel members, and, and thank you for listening, and over to Patrick. Well, before opening the floor to uh, questions, I want to make a few uh, remarks about, contextual remarks about what we've just heard. I think it is incredibly important, and I would like to start by um, thanking the farmers for your uh, willingness to put yourselves forward for these case studies. And I want to particularly thank Jim. Jim, you know, you, I think, really uh, were very courageous in, in allowing your farm to be used as a case study. And I think, as you said, it, it's benchmarking, or it's moving towards benchmarking a system on an individual farm basis. And I remember, I think yesterday, Alexander Muller mentioned this in relation to the work that Pavan and Alexander are doing uh, on farming and food system externalities. We need to move towards individual farm studies, yes, but we also need to identify the systemic nature of the particular system, which could be scalable to other farms. We need to do the two together, so that, for instance, my own farm, I want Harpenter to come and visit it and do his methodology, and I want to find out how I'm doing on this, and I want to know the elements of my system which are common to other organic dairy farmers, so that Albert and I can talk and look at the metrics and I can learn from him, and et cetera, et cetera. And also, you've got to remember, each farm is climatically and, and, and soils-wise an individuality. So, but at the same time, there's a systemic approach that Albert and I are both adopting. So there's hugely significant opportunities here also to communicate with individual consumers. Because if we can find a way of benchmarking all this, this is really powerful. Remember, after 11 o'clock, the next session, we're going to be looking at um, ways of changing things. We're looking at interventions and uh, policy and economic interventions which can move the policy climate and the economic climate to favor the kind of farming systems that we've come up with using this kind of tool. And also, already mentioned, there's one of the parallel sessions, which is looking at convergence on the metrics, because there are quite a few different systems, and Harpenter has been brave enough to offer his methodology for transparency and scrutiny. It may not be perfect, dare I say. It, there may be other methodologies out there that in some ways can improve on Harpenter's methodology. But if we're all open and we're trying to uh, be able to compare different systems using uh, methodologies were at least moving towards uh, a, a common system, this will enable us to look at any farming system, any farm in the world, and come up with data which will be meaningful for the research community and also meaningful for the consumers. So, this is a, for me, this is really, really exciting, and I cannot thank uh, Jane Maylan Cady and the McKnight Foundation enough for your willingness, there you are, uh, to say, yes, we'll uh, put money in to, to uh, support the funding of this program. So thank you as well. So this, this is just the beginning, and now I open the floor to questions. If you could identify it yourself and also try to keep it uh, fairly tight, and uh, then we'll, I'll take three, and then I'll uh, open it up to uh, the, the panel. Right. Uh, Please, yes, the lady there in the, with, the, with the green. Wait, can you wait? Get to the microphone. Oh, uh, sorry, you're first. Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank the speakers for the wonderful presentation of family-owned farms. 
My question is really for Dr. Santo. Uh, would you please comment on how does your analysis take into account the externalized costs associated with human health, one, and two, research, extensive research that farmers don't have to pay for? Thank oh. you. Oh, yes, we'll take a second question. Yes, please, we'll take three. Well, hi, good, uh, good morning, Sabella Krauss. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. I'm wondering um, whether you're looking to extend this work so that you look at indirect benefits, which are really done more at the community scale. I mean, there are studies here that show that communities, uh, like at the county scale, that there's at least a 100% uh, or 50% higher benefit for the indirect costs in the nearby rural communities for vibrant and successful agriculture. And it seems that also on the social benefits, there are a whole set of cultural benefits that um, also could be captured when you look at the community scale. So I'm curious to what extent some of these studies will go in that direction. Thank you. The third question. Here, um, Joel, great presentation. You've really created an amazing model. Uh, my name is Jim Slum. I work with Family Farm in Chicago. We do a lot of work to help farmers get access to markets, scale up, get financed. Uh, nobody in the, our area is doing anything even remotely close to what you're doing. What could it take? What kind of capital costs would there be to create such an operation? Uh, what kind of training do you think it's going to take, you know, a young farmer who, you know, emulates this kind of a system and wants to do it? And, you know, any other advice for, you know, helping bring this into other areas? Because it's awesome. So, Harmander, I think the first two questions really were both for you, weren't they? Yeah. Um, thank you for your question on um, this environmental health issues. I think, as, as Patrick mentioned, this, we are still developing this methodology. So, we are looking for that data on, like, what are the impacts on public health, and then narrow it down to the per acre level or per pound or per, per gallon of a milk kind of a level. So, certainly, we have found the methodology but we need those linkages. So those links are still missing. And yesterday I went to a, one of the parallel session on public health. So wonderful research and wonderful data is sitting there. So we need to extract that information and translate back into, into our model so that how we can capture some of those public health impacts and estimate the dollar value of the per, um, like a pound or a bushel of a commodity. So thank you very much for highlighting that. So we are, we are working on, on that issue. And the second was, uh, question was about capturing cultural benefits. We have tried to capture some of the social benefits associated with recreation, but definitely these cultural benefits, they extend beyond to the communities. So it's, the benefits are not just to the farming family or the farmer workers, but it extends to the churches or banks or schools. So we know, we, we very much realize those kind of a benefits, but we are still struggling with our methodology, how to capture them. Because lots of that information is qualitatively available. So we need to put some numbers so that we can capture and reflect as we move forward and as we converge on different methodologies which some other researchers are doing, already doing, and how we can capture that. So before I go to Joel, just to say this, you're identifying what we need to do. We need, to, we need common metrics, we need to identify, categorize, then learn to quantify and then monetize the range of costs and benefits. And the two questions have identified two challenging areas where the, as we heard yesterday, the monetized value in the case of uh, uh, the Kaiser Permanente uh, data of these negative externalities might be enormous, but we are just at, in the early yeah. stages of learning how to monetize them. So this is, uh, we can move forward from this as a result in part of what we've learned at this conference. So Joel, to you, your, your question. Uh, yeah, boy, I, if, if, I had a, if I had a magic answer, Jim, to your question, um, I, I, anyway, I'd be doing something else, I guess. Um, but you know, how do we how do we move that? How do we move that forward? Um, I think there are a couple things. One is we just need we need more young people 
savvy and we do a really formal intern apprenticeship program, uh, very formal. When we do actual formal lectures, we do feel, I mean, we, it, it's, a, it's a big deal. Um, and we are blessed with some of the best young people in the world, but we are taking 10 of 200 applicants. And it's easier to get into Yale and Harvard than it is to become an apprentice at, at, at Polyface. But I can tell you, every single one of our graduates can pick from 30 places that they, if they want to go someplace, everybody wants one. Why? Because they've been through the fire, they've been tested, they know they can get up in the morning, put in a full day's work, and we, we, we've talked about uh, billing it not as an apprenticeship program, but as a body bu- bodybuilding program. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and I think that just the, it, it's a surprising thing to realize what, when we say farm life, you know, if a cow's having a calving problems at 10 o'clock, you're out there. If, 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 a, if a great horned owl is getting in the chickens in the pasture, I sleep with them. You know, it, it's not punch the time clock, minimum wage, and get, are you with me? It's, it's a, it, it's a, it's an, it's a wonderful life, and we have days off, too. You know, when it rains, I just read all day, right? So, so, so it, um, it's, it, it's, a, it's a different kind of life, and I think that our culture right now, in our enamorment of the Dilbert cubicle, the Kardashians, and uh, goodness, separates you from your iPhone and you're, you know, dead, um, we, we just are not cultivating the kind of character, perseverance, and, and, uh, and entrepreneurial personal savvy that it takes to, to really adopt this, this farming. Yeah, I, I think we're also working on how do we get technical skills and agricultural skills back into the high schools and junior colleges? How do we work on getting, um, so we're working, working with with the state, the local, we have, uh, uh, there's nonprofits that are working on that, us career technical education programs. Um, we're also having the universities. Uh, Chico State has an organic dairy program. We're working on internship programs. And then we're looking at incorporating a New Zealand model for, uh, for they have institutionalized for getting people experience on farms and working towards equity. And um, so that's something that we're really trying to push forward with a, to try to get the next generation in succession. So how do we put a value on human cap- capital, on character, on the sort of attitude that we've lost in the last, well, in, during my farming lifetime, of the capacity to do the sort of work that Joel is, is speaking about? And... Uh, what Albert has just, just added as well. I mean, these, these issues are challenges for our system of monetizing. And as was said repeatedly yesterday, you can't put a price on everything, but at the same time, you want to value it in some way. So this, these are really exciting challenges. The next three questions. Somebody's got the microphone somewhere, hopefully. I'll try and keep them short and let's get lots in. I just want to echo Patrick's comments to Jim and my question is to Jim. Um, Your system of reduced strip tillage looks really intriguing, building the organic matter. I'm just wondering if you've seen benefits to disease, reduced disease insect pressure and the addition of increased organic matter in reducing diesel costs and kind of what of the unforeseen benefits that you've seen from adopting strip tillage? Right, number two, someone there? Yes, please. Hello, uh, this is Yael Falakov. I'm with the Global Alliance of of the Future of Food and really grateful for this excellent presentation, um, very important research. Uh, We just heard from Joel how hard farming is. And yesterday at the last plenary, we heard about farm workers and how half of them earn under the minimum wage and the incredible difficult conditions many of them are in. I'm wondering, Dr. Sandhu, if your research took into account uh, farm worker wages at the different farms 
or if that's something you're planning to take into account. I know that for the fast food industry, for example, there's been calculations of the, so, uh, the externalities of having low wages uh, and in terms of uh, food stamp benefits, healthcare costs, et cetera. So I'm wondering if that's going to be part of this methodology as well. Thank you. Wonderful question. Third, third question. Uh, I'm Dennis Baldaghi, UC Berkeley, and I've really enjoyed the presentations here. But I have a question to Dr. Sandu about his methodology. And I guess I was a little concerned about double counting. I mean, when he did the soybean and corn analysis, you either have soybeans or corn or a fraction, and he added the corn and the soybeans. And also, my grandparents raised dairy in Marin County back in the 1960s, and they were able to run about 100 cows per 1,000 acres. So I was kind of wondering, how do you come up with $8,000 per acre with a dairy operation here in California without these other externalities? So I'm just kind of concerned about the numbers. OK, who wants to take the first question? That was yours. Andrew. I could take the first one. Well, <clears throat> the benefits that I've seen with strip-till, no-till, um, we're, we're slowly increasing our organic matter uh, on the soil, which in turn is, is uh, helping to reduce some of our fertilizer needs. We've reduced so far uh, the rates uh, on fertilizer by about 30 percent and uh, still maintaining yield. Uh, fuel about 40 percent. It takes a lot of fuel to intensively till the soil. And then the, the erosion um, issue is, is, is not completely gone away because we're still tilling a little bit, but um, a, a marked improvement. And I think it's just going to keep getting better and better. And the old adage in, in corn production and soybean production is we needed to manage residue in the northern corn belt to get the yield because we're a little cool up there. The blacker the soil, the warmer it is. My dad taught me, you got you to gotta till, manage that residue, bury it. Um, we're finding out with no-till and strip-till, let the biological activity work on the soil, and it kind of takes care of itself. It yeah. takes a little time for that to happen, but it's, I think we're going in the right direction. I, I think you, the question and your answer has illuminated the truth that when Harpenter described you as a conventional corn soy farmer, that wasn't quite right. I think you're a, a corn, corn soy farmer with environmental and social aspirations <laughs> and who's making real progress. And maybe that's true of a lot of corn soy farmers, but we need to create the, the structure to enable many, many for, more farmers to follow in your footsteps. That's so right. this is another aspect, isn't it? Yeah, uh, sure. Carpenter, your, 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 the second question was to you. Yes, um, thank you for this highlighting this issue of wages and uh, uh, employment creation. We did, we, we did consider all the farm employments at uh, different farms. So we have considered those like values associated with that and we realized that that's very easy to capture. Uh, it, it, it's straight away uh, like, uh, available in the farm records. Um, but the impacts of low wages, how they generate those externalities, which we, we did not look into this particular case study, but we do realize that if there are some conventional farms where low wages or <coughs> are involved, so what are the implications? So we would like to examine those uh, implications as well. So that's so. arising out of the food justice session and also um, the Whole Foods Transparency Initiative that Walter Robb mentioned. There's, there's a really interesting area here for further development. Yes, yeah, yeah, definitely. So the third question. Third question I got was about double counting. So when you're talking about nature's and ecosystem functions, so it's, it's a normal that you will talk about double counting. But I think here we are talking of ecological system. It's not just economic system. So unless you capture all the ecosystem functions, because the final product is like, uh, is the, it's the end of all these means. So ecosystem functions are those means. And the end product is corn or soybean. So that's how we have, in this particular study, I have captured all those ecosystem functions. And then, like, I have submitted, or the, the final value is 
like a summation of all those ecosystem functions. So I, I think when we are talking of economic system, we can talk about double counting. But if we do not assess or value individual ecosystem functions, that, that's what we have been doing for years. So that, that, that has resulted in lots of negative externalities because we do not value those individual ecosystem functions. Mm. So that's why I don't think th there is an issue of ecosystem um, double counting in this case. So I would okay. like to discuss a little discuss. bit later. Yeah. 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 I, I, right. If I may, Please. I think his question was the $8,000 per acre of simply of milk production. In other words, that, that was the figure. Am I, yeah, that, that um, I don't think anybody's arguing yet about the other things hanging on at the environmental. The question, the, it, it was the empirical question of $8,000 per acre just in, raw, in, in the commodity value of the milk. That was the figure, I think. And, and is it partly because you're doing so much value adding or because the milk is so expensive? Uh, so Albert, the, I'm, I'm looking well, at Albert. I, I'm looking at me, but I... I mean, you, you, you just took the milk check and divided it by the acres, correct? Yeah. It's Harpenter's Yeah, so Harpenter's this is average calculus. of like four farms, so 200 cows to 800 cows. And then the acres also differ between about 150 to 200, 2,500 acres. Yeah. So, so if you take the average, right. so this is average, so this is not specific about one particular farm. But can I just say but, that without getting into the weeds on this, this is the value of being transparent about this, your methodology, because the, the, the critique of you will improve the, the means of analysis. If, we, if, if you've spotted something, let's, let's get it right. But, it, but So thank you, Harvinder, for being brave enough to do that, because that's yeah. what all these methodologies need to be scrutinized so they can come together. Um, so who's, who's been so uh, uh, left out and who wants to make a question? And can we quickly have three more? Hi, Emily Cassidy, Environmental Working Group. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. I have a quick question for um, Harpenter about the environmental benefits, and that's um, as compared to what? Um, in Minnesota, for example, are you comparing a corn soy system to an acre of prairie grasses, or are you comparing it to fallow soil? Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. There's a second mic already going. Okay. Whoever has the other mic, you can ask your question now. This one. Um, no, oh, sorry. You'll have to be first the next round. Herb Aarons from uh, California Farm Link. Uh, my question is for Jim. Uh, you had talked about uh, some of the USDA disincentives um, that resulted from the type of uh, strip agriculture that you're doing and how crop rotation was more difficult due to that government policy. Do you see any change in the USDA movement towards crop insurance versus uh, price supports? One, and two, what changes would you make in that crop insurance policy to incent diversification, crop diversification? Right. Any of you, which, which of the three questions would any of you like to take, just to crunch them in? I could take that question right now. Yeah. Um, the, the ag policy is, is structured, and it has been for years, on, on production, and that's the incentive for the farmers. The more he produces, um, the better off you are. And I think that, that environment environmental protection um, is, it, it, it's hard to, because we don't get paid to do environmentally friendly things, it's hard, at, from a business standpoint, it's only, it's economic, that's what's driving the management decisions, and what would, what could change that is, is a farm policy that's more friendly uh, to uh, the environment, and using some of the data that what Harpenter is trying to do is put a price on, on uh, uh, poor environmental practices. Yeah. That would be, I, I would say it's a policy change yeah. is needed. And this is, oh, don't forget, mechanisms for change 
Corby Cumner is somewhere here, I hope. This is material for the next session. Albert. So I just quickly want to say there are programs for environmental uh, or um, ecological programs for the USDA and uh, NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service. <laughs> Sorry, there you are. Incentivizes um, up to usually up to about 50% of practices to to maintain water streams and repairing areas, as well as practices to uh, for pollution control and different things. Fences, water. There's a lot of different uh, practices they do incentivize. That's that's true. It, it's a little hard. I mean, some farmers are resistant to to get into these programs because of. It, you know, the administrations change from year to year. There's no consistency to it. So you're kind of in and out of environmental conservation programs, which doesn't work very well. Yeah. Joe? Here's one that doesn't participate in any of them. Um, I don't want to see a bureaucrat. I don't want to fill out the paperwork. As far as I'm concerned, every time a bureaucrat calls, they mess up my life. So I don't want them. I do my thing. I'm transparent. Our customers come to the farm and traipse around it and commune it with the butterflies and the birds. We explain what we're doing, and um, so, it's, it's, a very, it's a very direct, direct relationship. And, 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 and the, the farms that we rent that have participated in the government programs, we end up either destroying those, those infrastructure that the government has built because they don't work, or we just forget about them and put in our own systems because they actually work. Joe, I think, no, I think we're talking about also about farmers trying to, to not everybody can do what you're doing. So okay. how do you get the farmers yeah. to move towards those practices and be able to help them be successful? Power of the customer. To, to be continued, um, which of the three questions, excuse my temporary lapse, have we not answered? We didn't get three, we only got two because this gentleman didn't get to ask his. Yep, okay. That's right. Uh, my name is Yasser. Uh, I'm a PhD student. My research is uh, in organic farms and profitability. Uh, thank you for the informative presentation and sharing the case study. Uh, so, hopefully I'm not mistaken. What you present here or the case study, it is about the cost benefits for the products, uh, farming products, from the economic perspective. So, do you have a plan that a case study or for future or currently, which is to do the cost benefit for the farming, organic farming, from the accounting perspective? Because you know the accounting can help more, which is whether where where the farms are standing in the market, they are beneficial or they are. They, have, they, they lost or they, they have a benefit, a profit, profitable or not. Accounting perspective, just... Do you want to take that yeah, very quickly? quickly I would there. like to say that there are a number of studies which have done those kind of a benefit cost uh, uh, comparison of organic or conventional, but here I have presented only the environmental related benefit and cost, but we do have the information about the normal benefit and cost of a farming operation, like inputs or outputs. So I, I'm happy to share that information with you. Yeah. you. If, I, if I take any more questions, I'm stealing your coffee break. Uh, are we okay to stop now? Okay, uh, do either, any of the four of you want to make any one sentence concluding remarks? Well, well I, I just want to thank Carpenter and I think this is a very important discussion to have. I think that um, I, it, it, it invigorates me to, to keep going with what I'm doing and, and keep innovating and making a better farming system. So thank you, Arbiter. And I would like to thank all these uh, panel members who participated in this study and uh, generously shared their data their time and effort uh, so that we have come this far. And, and as Patrick mentioned, we are working in a, in a global environment where through Deep Ag Food Project, where we are trying to improve this methodology. So it's not the end, it's the beginning. So I would like to say thank you to all. Thank you. So, uh, I don't want to say anymore because I'm personally 
inspired by this work, and it is, as Harpenter says, just the beginning. And there are so many more people who are going to help in taking this forward. So thank you all. Blessings on you for doing what you did. And let's move forward and explore some of the implications in the next session at 11 o'clock. Thank them again, please.